Hello, and welcome to Patmos. Thank you for watching and or listening. Today we're going to be talking about a variety of topics. It's mostly about the concept of obedience, God's will, where we find ourselves today. We're going to be talking a little bit about Traditionis Custodis, uh, the motu proprio from Pope Francis, but not necessarily specifically about that. Um, but we'll get into that here in a minute. I'd like to ask everybody who's listening uh, to the podcast to leave a rating if they can on iTunes. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube right now, uh, like the video, subscribe, hit the notification bell, all that kind of normal good stuff. And I also actually have a small community uh, that I started on Locals.com, which is more outside uh, the Silicon Valley control mechanism uh, that exists on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, joining is free. Reading is free, but if you want to comment, if you want to post, uh, the minimum set by locals is $2 a month, uh, which I use to pay for equipment, hosting, the editing programs, and things like that. If you'd rather donate via cryptocurrency, the pinned welcome post uh, has those uh, on the local site, has those addresses listed. And you can find that at ozymandias.locals.com, O Z Y M A N D I A S dot locals. Dot com. Uh, you can also find me on Twitter uh, at twitter.com slash paracelsus burns. That's P A R C E L S U S B R N S dot or <laughs> com. Anyways, so I wanted to let's just get this out of the way because that was kind of like my little pin for doing the welcome here. Um, this is, uh, I don't have any notes. I don't uh, have anything. I've been kind of mulling this over and I apologize. Uh, to people for not having uh, put out anything for a while because it has been uh, quite a while and one of the reasons for that was that um, I had uh, some uh, trips and stuff planned I was going to visit my parents for a week um, bring my daughter home and then uh, I also went on a retreat over the Feast of St. Benedict at the Benedictine Abbey at Our Lady of Clear Creek Monastery. And then after that, there was a bunch of family stuff, and I've been trying to get work done on the chapel, etc., etc. So, um, not to belabor you with my own personal things, but just wanted to explain why I hadn't. I've been trying to go over, in my mind, the, the retreat... Um, just give a little background. Our Lady of Clear Creek. I'm not going to pronounce this right um, you know, because it's French, but uh, um, I think it's called pronounced Font Bolt. Um, it has a storied history. It was a monastery up until the uh, French Revolution, where it was basically shut down and sacked. And then um, at a later point, Benedictines started to return. And it's a traditional. Uh, order of Benedictines. Um, they maintain the traditional rule. They practice the ancient rite. Um, and then they grew to a point where they decided that they wanted to establish an American order because so many young men from America were coming over to join. And what they've done is they looked all around and then they were invited by the Bishop of uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. And they found a big stretch of land that they were able to purchase and from basically uh the they can they i don't know if they constructed it or if it was already there but it was basically a a steel barn of sorts um that they constructed a chapel and some rudimentary living quarters and because of generous donations and just the, the work they've expanded uh quite significantly where they now actually have an abbey under construction, not completely built. The crypt um, is where they say all the masses, the the main area, um, or I should say the the, the upper uh, abbey is not completely finished. Um, it's raw concrete floor, but uh, the roof and everything and the pews are all in there. And it, it's a very beautiful experience. I would recommend if anybody has the ability to, um, they take donations um, basically to stay there. I think it's like between 40 and $50 a night if you stay at the lower. I stayed where the original 
um, housing was and in that steel barn. And then so I had to walk up to the Abbey, which is a, a, a short walk. Um, and uh, for the various, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours, the Divine Office, uh, it's said every day, um, seven times a day. And it was very moving. There was a wonderful group of people. And it, it's, it's, what's amazing is that they are unlike a lot of orders where they are either having to move and, and consolidate. They're actually expanding to the, the point where um, they have way more people interested in joining than they do, um, than they have room for to the point where they've kind of stopped construction on the abbey to a point to finish the building of a new swing of housing because uh, some of the monks are living in the housing that's already been built some are living in sheds basically um out on the property and just to see the lay brothers they're not allowed to talk to us i mean we can ask them questions um as far as for hey is the abbey up that way or you know uh, basic questions and they'll motion if they can they'll they might say a word if that's necessary to convey the information necessary. But it was very moving. It was so quiet. Um, except for, you know, the, the bells ringing for mass, the bells ringing for the divine office. And it's also a, a Catholic community has sprung up where people are moving to be and live around there. And they show up every day. There's families with large numbers of kids that show up. Uh, for mass uh, definitely on Sundays um, and for daily mass as well and then there, there's a whole group of people that show up for the various hours of the day too and you basically go and you I was I was late because of my my plane um, I wasn't able to uh, make it there for sext and um, uh, sext is the the term for kind of the midday prayers um, and lunch but uh so i had to check in a little bit later than i wanted to um, but i wandered around there for a little bit and it was really a experience i'm still kind of figuring out what i was kind of given there and how to implement it um in my life one is um, something i do feel adequate enough to talk about is this to quiet contemplation um, as well as a kind of a penitential outlook um, finding a quiet space and in, in creating that in your own life and it makes this chapel project um, even more which I've been able to do some work on now even more important to me um, the idea of kind of cutting things out that are not helpful to your spiritual development. Um, especially the lay brothers spend their day working, whether it's in the fields with the animals, fixing stuff, depending on what they're, you know, what they're best at, um, as well as just quietly working. And the Benedictine concept of aura et labora, prayer and work, um, where if you fill your days uh, with work at a very basic level, keeping yourself busy, you have less time to fall to temptation, to contemplate or to allow those sorts of temptations to come into your life. But more importantly, that you look at all the little things you do, which is, we do so many things that are mundane, uh, taking out the garbage, making a dinner, um, cleaning up, vacuuming, you know, these are very mundane, normal tasks that we do every day. And the, the concept of turning those acts into prayer, which I, I understand the concept and I'm trying to do that. I mean, at a, the most basic level of praying while I work, um, but also of approaching these things with joy and reverence, offering them up to God so that that very act becomes a work. And I, I don't claim to have any sort of mastery of it, of course, of course. Um, but uh, uh, it has been very helpful to me in, in, in that aspect. But there's been some other things I'm still trying to figure out. Um, 
but to get into the the more of the topic today, it's something that I thought it was very fitting that I got home from that. I think it was the 11th, 12th. So I got home like the 12th or 13th. I can't remember exactly the date. And it was literally a few days later that Friday is when Traditionis Custodius got released. And just as a background for anybody that's maybe not Catholic and kind of primed into this kind of inside baseball, this was um, Moto Proprio, which is kind of Latin for the by my hand um, letter that came out from Pope Francis disseminated to the bishops, um, basically putting restrictions on the traditional mass um, as, as, it, as, as it's been practiced from the moto proprio that St. Benedict or St. Benedict that Pope Benedict the 16 issued in 2007 under some more pontificum that just to give a very brief history after Vatican II there was basically a suppression of the Latin mass and people kind of had to do it um, almost underground in a way they had to do it in you know hotels and people's houses and things like that and then as it started to actually grow and grow underground um, as it started to grow, uh, and a lot of the issues that were coming up in the post-conciliar Catholic world, uh, Pope Benedict gave a great gift of basically saying it was never abrogated. The ancient rite was never abrogated. And, and by that he means by abrogated, it was never, you know, suppressed. It was never canceled. It was never, you know, stopped. It was never not okay to continue, um, to do the ancient rite versus the Novus Order, the new mass that was promulgated in the Missal of 1970 or 69. Um, and that was a great gift. And, and, and since then, we've seen just growth of these traditional orders, institutions, um, growth of these masses. Uh, and some of it, um, definitely a, a, a large chunk um, people say, well, these are just Catholics leaving their diocesan parish going over there. And that's true. But I'm, I'm aware of a lot of like, just the, the, a lot of this is subjective. So at the, 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 uh, oratory that I go to, um, there've been a, a, a decent amount of conversions of people, um, from Anglicanism and various other Protestant sects, um, to the church because of their immersion into the ancient rite. And I don't want to go over what a lot of, I mean, like there's been in, in kind of the, the trad world, if you want to call it that, um, which I, I don't like, it's not that I don't, you know, go and like, I don't like being associated with those people. Right. But I mean, like, I don't like trying to set ourselves apart per se, because I think it just, creates an outlier group that can be attacked. But there is some distinction, obviously, that has to be made. And I don't want to go over what a lot of those people have been talking about, whether, you know, like this, you know, line by line by line by line by line. Um, but the gist of it was, was that the Pope said that he'd put out uh, basically a survey asking how, to every bishop, supposedly, that how are you doing in your specific diocese with these, you know, communities, these uh, run by the Fraternity of St. Peter, uh, run by the Institute of Christ the King, and there's various other institutes and stuff that that uh, are basically traditionally oriented and practice the ancient rite. And because of that feedback, he says that's, you know, that he's concerned with people who believe that they are now the true church and that you know, uh, the Pope in Rome and, and those who go to a diocesan parish are somehow not the true church, right? Um, people who actually have that view uh, are, I would say, already in material schism with the church, and that is a dangerous place to be. I reject sedevacantism. I reject um, this, uh, anything kind of associated with that, uh, because I think that once you I understand why I understand that people are trying to wrap their heads around all the kind of stuff that's gone on in the last 30 years that they look back and they see in 1940s and 1930s, they see, you know, Wrigley field in Chicago filled packed to the brim with people for various holy days. 
and they're not, you know, and now they're going, well, I see like six people at my parish, right? Or something like that. Or my parish was closed and consolidated. And um, just to be able to kind of fill one church. And this is Christianity wide. There's no denomination that's, that, that has been kind of spared this attack of modernity. And I think, um, you know, the, the scandals and all these sorts of things that people are trying to wrap their heads around of one, having a deep faith in Christ, believing that the church is the one true church founded by God, that the keys were given to St. Peter and that the church of Rome is the, and the, the Pope are the inheritors of those keys. But then trying to go, the, the wackiness, to put it mildly, and to put it more to a point, the irreverence, the sacrilege that has gone on, the scandals, and then trying to meld those things, right? It can be very difficult um, to meld this idea of Christ's church and then these public images of these men who are fallen, to say the least, supposedly leading it. And so some people fall into the idea of sedevic Kantism that the chair is vacant. So every time a pope dies, um, to explain this term better, every time a pope dies, there's a period of sedevic Kant that the chair is empty until a new pope is elected. So for that, let's just say it's a month, a week, whatever it is. The chair is empty. There is no pontiff. There is no pope. There is no... Um, uh, successor to St. Peter. And this isn't some sort of theological issue. It's just what happens in between. And some people have gone to say, well, since Pope Pius XII, there's actually been no legitimate elections because of this, that, or the other. And the thing is, is that none of it, it makes for fun reading. It makes for an interesting what if, but none of it is verified, validated, or has any legitimacy beyond this guy said this, or obviously because of that, this is why. But none of it, in my estimation, follows any sort of logic. And if you start to go down the idea that, well, until I get a pope who does exactly what I like, the chair is vacant, um, or reverses this or that, that the chair is vacant, then you're just going to be basically in the same boat as, as um, a lot of other schismatic offshoots, the old Catholic Church. Um, which are, interestingly enough, the group that calls themselves the Old Catholic Church, I think they split off in like the 17 or 1800s um, in, in small parts of Europe. I think it was mostly like up around Belgium and all that. They are now as, they call themselves the Old, which would make you think it's more embracement of the ancient, um, but they've actually embraced, they're, they're basically indistinguishable from uh, Anglicanism at this point. But anyways, I digress. And... I had a want at first to jump on YouTube and express the, the pain that I had, because I did have an intense feeling of pain, especially on that day of, because you do look to the Pope as the successor of Peter, as, as a fatherly figure. You want him to be like, no matter what's going on in the world, right? The prince of this world is constantly attacking Christ and his church. And then, you know, is constantly trying to tempt you. Is constantly trying to get you to fall away, right? And that, you know, even in times of not saying I'm living through that, you know, a persecution on, um, to the extent of, you'd say, like after the Russian Revolution or um, during Nazi Germany uh, times or uh, French Revolution or, you know, on and on and on Romans. But, like, even if the worldly powers are arrayed against you, like, you could do, like, I can always look to the church, but specifically to the head of the church for this kind of confirmation and this sort of fatherly embrace of sorts as Christ's vicar on earth and kind of saying, stay, you know, stay strong be steadfast in your faith, you know, all these sorts of things. And then to have kind of this trying, you know, uh, doing our best and trying to live a fully Catholic life. And right. And, the, and we'll get into this a little bit, but not just 
not just the mass, not just the liturgy and the ancient rite, right? But also of just going beyond that and, and, and living a fully Catholic life, fully embracing Christ, fully embracing his church, fully embracing the way we're supposed to live. You know, averting our eyes from things that could tempt us, not watching um, things that will be detrimental to us. Um, you know, staying away from, say, you know, like pornography, staying away from um, drinking, staying away from these things, not practicing contraception, um, not allowing yourself to fall into all the sorts of things that modernity tells you are okay, but Christ and his church have always said are not, right? And it is easy at some time, at, at points, you'll have just this explosion of grace in your heart. And it's easy. You just go, yep, yep, yep. No, I'm good. I'm apart from this world. And then at other times, you just go like, man, it would be so much easier to fall into it and just fall in line and do all the things that everybody says are the proper ways of being. And you look and you want that kind of that fatherly figure to say, no, son, you're doing you're doing the right thing. You are living the correct life. And to kind of have this embrace, you know, looking to the ancient rite as a way to, through the liturgy, bring you closer to God. And then having that kind of thrown in your face and saying, no, you're too rigid. You're too, um, you're too Catholic, I guess, in a way, uh, was very painful. Um, but I, what I saw in the aftermath was a couple of things. Um, some people like myself were just staying quiet, um, trying to really kind of pull it in. And I understand that some people, whether it's, you know, it's their bread and butter to respond immediately and just give the, the, the take right away. And it's not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but I think it needs to be very much couched. And we'll get into what I mean by that as well. I think that a lot of, people immediately let that anger rise up in them. And a good thing that I have learned and don't put into practice all the time or enough, I should say at all, uh, is to understand that when you are feeling an intense amount of anger or a little bit of anger, or like that is what's driving you to speak, to act, all these sorts of things. That's a really good indication that you need to either not speak or not act in the way that your anger is driving you to and take time, whether it's an hour or it's five minutes or an hour or a day or a year to do that because you're not going to be acting. You're not going to be acting in the way that God needs you to. You're not going to be um, at best. You're just, fulfilling some sort of carnal desire, not carnal, but some sort of base desire, some sort of temptation to anger and just making yourself feel better for a second and causing you to fall into to a state of sin um, by doing that. At worst, you're going to scandalize not only yourself, but as a, a representative of, of Christ. I mean, like, and I've talked to my children about that. It's like how we act is how people not only view us, but view what we believe in. So if somebody's got a coexist bumper sticker and they give you the finger or whatever, like you're obviously going to go like, oh yeah, okay, fine. You know, like whatever, you know, I'm glad you're really living that peaceful lifestyle, right? In the same way that if somebody sees a Jesus fish on there and then they get cut off or that person is zigzagging out of traffic and just acting ridiculous or is wearing a cross on their, on themselves, and then starts berating somebody for like a ridiculously unnecessary thing, or even at all, you're going to go, well, that's what Christians believe. And I think that we need to be much more careful about how we do that. And I saw some well-known accounts that are trying to promote the ancient right and the ancient way of living and kind of a return to Catholicism for Catholics. Um, I don't want to, you know, name names because I don't think it's helpful because um, I've seen some of them change their tone um, past those first few days, but th they were just going and saying, you know, this is war. Uh, you know, we've been declared, you know, war, it, it, like just being 
vicious and how that they were talking about the Pope, how they were talking about uh, the Holy See, how, talking about Rome in general. And for non-Catholics out there, you go like, well, yeah, shouldn't you be? But no, because we are called to not like, and I've gone over this in, in previous episode, episodes and, and things I've written about of like the concept of a papal infallibility. It's just because a Pope writes something does not mean that we are saying that it's infallible. If a Pope makes an infallible statement, like about the Immaculate Conception, it is not up for debate. The, you know, after reading the theological arguments for and against and, and listening to all these sorts of things the Pope has through the grace of God declared definitively for all time. This is not something that they can go back and say, well, actually, no, when he declared this, then fallibly, he was actually wrong about it. It is 100% the use of the keys of the kingdom that Christ gave to Peter and saying what you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and is recognizing a truth that already existed before we realized that it was in fact a truth because prior to that, it was something that was debated. It was something that some people said, eh, maybe not, I don't know. There are different levels of ascent. Um, actually, I think we went over this um, in the episode with Cyprian about the levels of ascent and and what you basically are kind of allowed to do. And for a lot of people, especially if they're coming from more of a libertarian or American background, this idea of not being able to question something is very alien. And for some Americans, maybe not, but um, there's levels of assent, right? If something is an infallible teaching, if something is literal dogma, it's in the creed or something like uh, the Trinity, that is not up for debate. That has been absolutely decided upon. And you are not, I shouldn't say not allowed, you're allowed to disagree, but then you are falling into a state of sin because now you are falling into heresy, right? And there are levels of ascent all the way down on levels of teaching. And and the the I'm not a theological or papal scholar or anything like that. So I may, you know, if I say something and you are and you know that's not exactly true, know that it was not, uh, it was it was out of ignorance. But there's levels of ascent to papal decisions depending on where it comes. Modo propres are actually really the the lowest level. Uh, it's not a papal encyclical. Um, they're not uh, binding per se in terms of at the level of belief in the Trinity, but they are binding uh, in terms of we should give it the deference of basically a, a, a deference and an obedience. And same with the office. Even if a pope is a horrible man, you, you can look through... Um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the Borgias and that whole thing, like there's shows and all about that. And these popes that had wives and children out of wedlock. And, well, I mean, obviously they're out of wedlock because, you know, they're supposed to be uh, maintaining chastity and holy orders. Um, but all these, th there's a level of, it's by giving assent and obedience, you're not saying, I think that what they're, everything that they do is moral and right and all those sorts of things. But when they make pronouncements, there's a level of obedience that must be given until a time that it can be either shown or, or whatever to be, to be, uh, in, in, in error, I guess you could say. And most importantly, we as lay people, as much as, you know, the, um, especially coming from the West and especially America and of the social media generation. We have this idea that we need to have an opinion and one that is absolutely correct at all times about every little thing. And the fact is that most people don't know that much about anything. There's certain areas, maybe you know a lot about sports or like you're a big football fan. So you may know all these sorts of things and you may have a high degree of, uh, a high degree of knowledge and, and kind of, um, you know, artisanal ability in a certain area, you know how to work with wood, you know how to build a house, you know how to fix a car. In those areas, you do have some expertise in that. As the lay person and most of the people that I see, especially within traditionalists, act as though 
they are theologians because they've read two or three books or they read something that somebody posted that St. Pius V or Pope St. Pius V wrote back in at this point and this point and this point. The Pope has the absolute ability and right to, as has been recognized by the Church for a very long time, to make choices in liturgy. It does not mean necessarily that that is the right choice forever. Obviously, there's been organic development in the Church. There's a lot of people po uh, posting back to Trent and Pope St. Pius V, and this idea that when, you know, uh, some of the things that were said around the reorganization of the liturgy at that time, and saying that, well, the, you know, these things should never be changed, right? And they'll point to that and say, well, that's, I can't, it's origin. I can't remember the exact Latin name for it. It doesn't matter. And it says, basically, paraphrase that, you know, the things that have been set down in the Roman Missal of St. Pius V shall, you know, shouldn't be changed. They're not ever saying that no Pope at any time in the future cannot make a change. What they're saying is, is that at the time, there were so many different rites, the Ambrosian rite, the Dominican rite, everything like that. And they basically made a decision, I think it was like, if it was not older than 300 years or 200 years, um, it was basically no longer allowed. And that you were to adopt the new Roman rite set forth, which is, you know, what, when I'm referring to the ancient rite, um, as promulgated by Saint or Pope St. Pius V. But it does not mean that the Pope's never allowed to change. If that was true then the mass, the ancient rite, in the west or the east would not be valid because they have been changed. We've gone from, as much as I think that uh, communion um, on the tongue is preferable to communion on the hand, it's actually older to receive on the hand. Well, actually, left hand. and then So most of the early Christian churches, if you look back through, they were doing communion on the hand. Now, I think it is more reverent, and especially in modern times with the lack of catechesis, the lack of belief in the real presence of Christ, the lack of uh, respect um, that people have, communion on the tongue is definitely more called for for the times and is uh, a way to instill more reverence. I don't think the communion on the hand is a sin. And, uh, but I do prefer it as a symbolic act of deference and reverence to Christ and saying, I'm not going to touch it. And, and it's not because I think that I'm unworthy to, uh, I just think that it is more reverent and is more, it is, it is a more useful tool to promote reverence in these times. And I was talking to, um, someone we might actually do an episode together, um, so I'm not, I'm not going to say his name at this point, but um, uh, a gentleman on, on Telegram, and I was, what I was saying to him was that I believe that it's not that the Novus Ordo isn't valid at all. If you believe that the Novus Ordo um, isn't valid, isn't a valid mass in terms of that it is not a mass that uh, is that through it, the ritual... Um, and by ritual, it, a lot of people will take that as meaning just kind of some sort of rote thing that you just do and, and doesn't really have any meaning to it and has immense meaning. That the ritual itself does convey and transubstantiate the Eucharist into the real presence of Christ. But I think that the Novus Ordo is the exact wrong prescription for the times. Right? You have... The, when we talk about problems, and we'll just talk about modernity, modernity, and talking about um, the description of the problem, modernity, the lack of reverence, the falling away from God, the falling into occult belief, the falling into false religions that appear to not be religions, the, the serving of the prince of this world, are all descriptions of the problem. The prescription is what, what, what do we do to fix that? And I think the proper prescription is tradition. The proper prescription is the ancient rite within Catholicism, right? And this doesn't, uh, when, I, when I talk about the ancient rite being the prescription, I'm not talking about it being the only, because within Catholicism, there's a variety of rites, the Dominican rite, um, and, or Eastern rite. And Eastern rite Catholics are basically, if you went to an Eastern rite Catholic church, they would look indistinguishable from an Orthodox church. They maintain the, there's Byzantine Catholics, there's Melkites, there's Maronites. Uh, I think um, Maronites are one of the few um, Eastern churches that actually never went into schism. 
um, and always maintained uh, communion with Rome. But over time, some Eastern churches have recognized the Petron Promacy and uh, have come back into communion with Rome and have, but have maintained the kind of the Byzantine Eastern rites. And they look almost indistinguishable um, from uh, most, you know, it, there, there's going to be difference because there's differences in Greek liturgy versus Russian liturgy versus Serbian or whatever. Um, but a, a very basic, the look of the church icons, the candles, all these sorts of things, uh, the divine liturgy. And, and it's very, it's, it's absolutely gorgeous and it's beautiful. And it's part of the rich tradition of Catholicism. Um, so I'm not saying Eastern rites should adopt the ancient Latin rite uh, for the only prescription. I'm talking about tradition. And within the West, that is the ancient rite, um, most notably promulgated by uh, Pope St. Pius V. I think that that is the right prescription. I think the tradition, I think that uh, going back to the ancient and not just in the liturgy, and this is what I wanted to get into too, is that I see a lot of within traditional Catholic circles, at least, is that it is a lot of focus on the liturgy, which is very, very important because it is symbolic. All of these things are symbolic. And I don't mean symbolic as in a met, just a, like a merely just some sort of metaphor. Um, that is their, uh, uh, because it's hard to explain. I, I, I'm pretty sure that most of the people watching this or listening to this um, are aware of and have watched videos by Jonathan Pajot explaining, you know, the symbolic and the symbolic is, is real, as real as, you know, as, as real as the material I'm holding up a glass that we see before us, the symbolic, you know, the supernatural, all these things are just as real as ours. We just, we can't perceive the supernatural as it exists all the time. We touch it sometimes like we'll have a vision or we will see things, whether they are from the dark side of the supernatural to the light side, you will feel that grace of God. And that is not something, I mean, materialists would describe it as well. You're just, you just have, um, uh, you're just having a rush of endorphins or cortisol or, you know, whatever it is, right. That's why you feel that way, right? It's just these synapses firing. That's because materials cannot look past what they can touch. Right. Which is, I mean, also very interesting in that they will use devices to describe the material that they don't actually see with their own eyes. They are, they are looking through, I mean, the, a phone is, is a perfect example. Um, you're not seeing the stuff going on your phone here. Um, like it, it is visually represented to you, but what's actually happening within this and this is what um, Cyprian has talked about a lot. It's like, you know, any technology sufficiently advanced enough is indistinguishable from magic. And that was Arthur C. Clarke's way of describing, you know, when he says magic, he means the supernatural. Because, like, this is not actually what's going on. Like, your phone is not taking a literal Twitter app and move, you know, a, a picture of Twitter. And that's what is happening in there. These are visual representations of what's going on in this thing. You're looking through a microscope and um, electron microscope, let's just say, and it is information that it is taking in, that it's looking at, right? And then taking that information, shooting it up, and then it's being processed in a way that we can understand it. And, and while I'm not calling that supernatural, in a way it very much is. Um, in a way, it very much is supernatural because, I mean, that's very, uh, very much the same almost as the symbolic and the supernatural that we experience, like in the mass. Um, that is a part where, and a lot of us don't appreciate that. And I'm not saying like, I like fully understand and fully like really get the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, but that is a place where heaven and earth touch is every single Sunday, every day across the world at all hours of the day, heaven and earth touch. That is where Christ is present in that eternal sacrifice. Not as Protestants try to say that Catholics, Orthodox, et cetera, believe that it's, a, you know, there, there's a new sacrifice every time. And it's the same sacrifice 
that happened on Golgotha and Calvary. It's the same sacrifice. We're just participating in that. And it's a way for Christ to come down and touch the physical world in the same ways when he walked it. And the ancient rites, what they do is they are a better prescription for using all the, these symbolic uh, symbolism and ritual to focus our minds and forget about the modern world, to forget about mortgage payments, to forget about that fight you had, forget about um, what's going on in sports or politics or whatever it may be, and focus your mind by the music, by the decora. And that's why, you know, like if you go into a Protestant church or kind of like a modern Novus Ordo parish, and it's just like a mishmash of stuff. Um, no, I, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to talk about that because it still bothers me too much. But you go into these buildings and it's white sheetrock, white paint, you know, some weird uh, art piece behind the altar and all that. And none of it says heaven. And I understand that a bit when they say the art's objective and some people were like, no, no, no. And I get that to a point, but it really doesn't say heaven. It doesn't say God. It doesn't say, you know, the almighty, the king of Kings, the most high. It says 1970s depiction of what you want to represent kind of this idea of manna falling from heaven, right? In some sort of weird and it's symbolic, but it's, it's ugly symbolism and it's symbolism that does not lift your mind and your eyes and your heart and all this these all these parts of you up to God and recognize that in that moment you are experiencing heaven and earth touching. And I just said I wouldn't talk about it, but th there's one thing that I did want to say. I was just at a mass for a funeral and... Um, at the point in the mass where the consecration is being said after the Agnus Dei and the Novus Ordo, you lay the Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You kneel for the consecration, the point where the priest by his right, by his ordination is able to act in persona Christi and in the person of Christ and take what was before just a piece of unleavened bread and make that the body of Christ. And then right at that point where you would kneel, he said, everybody, please stay standing. And you can kind of guess how before and after how this mass went. And it's valid in terms of the ability to do that. But all of the symbolism, all of the lack of reverence that was going on, did not lead one to believe that we really believe that this is the body of Christ. And this is the main point is that the Novus Ordo, and if you actually, like, I will defend to, to an extent that if you actually read the rubrics of how it's supposed to be set, how it's supposed to be implemented, all these sorts of things, blah, blah, blah. Like there's a lot of things that aren't done. It opens so much and it's, and it's an attitude towards it because it's this idea of newness. So we can kind of experiment. And experimentation leads to a reverence, leads to sacrilege. That's why prior to, there was, like, there was no wiggle room from either in the rubrics or from the bishops on these sorts of things. It's not that sacrilege and irreverence didn't happen ever before. That's a ridiculous statement. Or that there weren't priests that were being irreverent. Like, you, like, a lot of trads seem to not talk to people that... Uh, like the average person that grew up with the Novus, with, with, I'm sorry, with the ancient rite. And there was a malaise that had already set in, that modernity was already getting its, its feels in there where they talk about, well, yeah, father would say a low mass, but it would be in like 20 minutes. Right. And that, I mean, that's a lack of reverence when you're trying to speed through your prayers, try to get it done so you can go off and do your other thing. Like this sense of malaise was already kind of creeping into just the minds of people and like, I want to get this done. Let's get it done. Like I got other stuff to get done, but I know that I have an obligation to, so let's just, but we know we're all here. Let's do it. Right. So it, it's this idea of that just because you 
the liturgy is the ancient rite doesn't mean that it's always going to be reverent. It's in the mindset of the people. It's this idea that we need to not only embrace tradition, but we also need to convert the minds uh, of just of living that full liturgical life, right? Of, of living uh, or of the full Catholic life, not just in the liturgy. And that all the, the mass is very important and the liturgy is very important. Our ability to do that, like I'm not saying like, oh, just don't worry about it. We, we don't need to do a Latin mass or like all this kind of stuff. But what's important is not the specific rite. What's important is the symbolism and the reverence and all that. And for a lot of traditionalists, that is like, I don't, this is a bad equation and I, I hate using it, but I can't think of a a better way of doing it a lot of people could not understand 2016 when trump was elected and what they did not realize is that trump was not about trump it wasn't that you know it's not that there were mega people that weren't like really big fans of him and didn't love him to an extent but it was never really about him it was about what he represented to them he represented and, and pardon my french a middle finger to a society and a culture and and the elitist institutions and academia and media and politics that looked down on them and just didn't just say you know what we got a better way but look down on them with disdain you cling to your guns and your religion you want you know like move on with the times you 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 know you idiot you know toothless redneck right trump was somebody to them that said no like this is actually a better way. That's what he represented to him. I'm not saying he was a good representation. He was a good symbol, but that's what he was. And I'm not equating Trump to the Latin mass, the ancient rite, but the Latin, um, the, the Latin mass, the ancient rite is to traditionalists kind of like this symbolic lightning rod of we die on this hill because this represents everything. And I don't necessarily think that that's the worst idea, but you start to become so focused on it that you forget about the other ways of being. And I'm not, as I continue accusing, you know, I'm generally speaking, I'm not talking about every individual. So if this does not pertain to you, then it doesn't pertain to you. But I see a lot of people that are traditionalists and they will do a, they, they kind of, a lot of them, maybe this is more of a Twitter thing than anything, but it seems like they like to, cosplay tradition in terms of i'm gonna smoke cigars and i'm gonna drink whiskey because that's what a man does right and it's this idea of and i'm not saying that we don't need a rebirth of of traditional masculinity in the way that it's supposed to be but this idea of we go back to 1950s masculinity is somehow a fix as well for the culture and the family is is dumb because there's a lot of people with some terrible tales about this, you know, like that's where the idea of toxic masculinity comes from because there were men who took advantage of this scriptural basis for the man leading the family and, and the woman being submissive to her husband and then decided, well, that means I get to do whatever I want. I get to tell her whatever she's going to do and she just has to deal with it. This is why feminine, like we never look back and go, why, like, why did feminism come about? It wasn't just because women were going, I would like to get into the workplace and out of the kitchen. It was because they were, a lot of them had personal experiences of that patriarchy. Now, women nowadays, I'm not saying this never happens or anything like that in the modern times, but a lot of the, the screeching, you know, purple hairs didn't have this sort of thing like they've always been able to go and do work or whatever and they're just kind of wanting they're wanting to fight against every last vestige to kill this aspect of the culture that comes from scripture they didn't actually have anyways i, I don't i don't want to go down deep into that but like this cosplaying of like this masculinity of like i smoke cigars and i drink whiskey because that's what a man does and blah 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 you know it's just, it's a cosplay it's no different than a ren fair of like well i'm gonna dress up like a knight and eat a turkey leg and you know this is this is me being you know a medieval knight it's like well no there's a lot more to it you don't have a mindset like the way you think is not how somebody in the medieval world would have ever thought your approach to it is completely different and and jonathan pajot talks a lot about this um i think it's richard Rohr, and they're talking about the medieval mindset and it's it's a selection of, there's i think two interviews so far and you should look at those 
um, of this idea of the, the medieval mind. Cause we don't think about, I, I, I don't have it either. I'm trying to learn better. And I think through the embracement of, of tradition and the embracement of symbolism, they very much lived in a symbolic world. They did not look at things of like, oh, well, you know, this happened, but that's because of the barometric pressure and all these sorts of things. And it's not that also those aren't useful, but we have so far in, in the modern world just rejected everything symbolic, everything of the medieval mindset to embrace materialist enlightenment thinking that we are gaining what we can from the material, but the bad parts of materialism are just destroying us. And that's where the medieval mind, it's like, it's really, it's like a hybrid mixture of this is what we kind of need. We need to focus more on the medieval mindset and embrace the, the goodness that, you know, the enlightenment, I guess you could say. And, and it's not a bad thing to use a tractor. It's not a bad thing to have a computer. I mean, obviously, um, it, but it's how we use that. And then how we use that, that's where the medieval mindset, the symbolic mindset comes in because that leads us to Christ. That leads us to living that fully Christian life. And I see a lot of trads to get back to that kind of cosplaying this traditional masculine idea. And then they're not doing the reading. They're not doing the, how do I really, you know, they're, they're praying their rosary, they're praying their stuff in Latin, maybe they're doing the monastic diurnal and stuff like that. But it's like, you know, as, as you start to get down and go, oh, well, you know, you, you know, like, um, reading Hildegard von Bingen's visions, like, oh, oh yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, I know who she is. It's like, they're not doing the spiritual readings. They're not living the actual life of that medieval mindset. They're just wanting to cosplay and wear the clothes of the medieval mindset without actually, you know, living that. Um, and actually fully embracing it, right? Smoking a cigar and drinking whiskey does not make you a man. What makes you a man in the truest sense that is expressed through the tradition as understood through uh, scripture and, 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 um, or I should say as example or, um, the, the true sense of masculinity that we know, like St. Paul and Corinthians, right? Yes. Men, your wives are to be submissive to your husbands, but there's a lot, there's more than just like, you do what I say. It's a matter of like this interplay of love and respect for each other and their roles not just as one masculine is better than the feminine not at all it is a like it doesn't work right this is a uneven system you need to have this symbolic and symbiosis of the two to actually make a family properly function right the the, the family does not work if it's just the masculine the family does not work if it's just the feminine. You have to have the two come together to properly function in the sense that God wants us to. And that's where you see those families that are integrated to a, you know, the fullest extent that, that you, that they can do so is the, the, you know, the families that you go like, oh, well, they're a really good family. Those are really good kids and blah, 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 whether they're poor or rich or anything like that. Um, and that's what we need to embrace. We need to focus on changing the culture. And it's not that if you go to these traditional parishes, the culture is much better. The, the culture is this traditional parish life. You go to these picnics and, and every, you know, you have these prayer groups and everybody knows each other and everybody kind of hangs out and you, and you intermingle in terms of just your friendship groups so that you're edifying each other and not having, well, and it's not, evil to have you know friends that are outside of the church or outside of kind of this embracement of the traditional culture but you also it, it, there is danger in that because they when when you're talking with them they're bringing the world to you right they're you know oh did you hear about this or did you watch this or let's do that or let's play you know this game that just you know talks about all these sorts of vulgar things or whatever or um when you are in times of crisis if all your friends are of the world and you're turning to them for advice and all that, they're not going to give you the Christian advice. It's going to lead you closer to God. It's going to help you make that decision that God wills. They're going to tell you what the world tells them. They're not evil in and of themselves, but they are passing along to you a level of temptation and evil. 
right? And this is what we need to guard against. This is what um, embracement of fully traditional cultures, creating community is a big part of that. Community is a huge part of that. And the idea that the only way that you can have and live a truly fully Catholic life is if you have the ancient rite available to you every single Sunday or daily or whatever is ridiculous. There's a multitude there's been millions and tens of millions of people throughout history, whether it was because the mass was suppressed, right? The church was suppressed or they converted, but lived in an area where there was no local church that were able to live. The idea that, well, um, when um, St. Athanasius was exiled for the thousandth time, I mean, granted he was a priest, but you know, he wasn't, having access to these sorts of things. So he wasn't able to live the fully Christian Catholic life is, is ridiculous. We can live that even within a Novus Ordo community. And if let's just say that the, the mass was fully suppressed, the ancient rite, which it's not. And I'll briefly mention that here in a second. Um, and reasons for hope as well. Um, is that if let's just say you had to do, the Novus Ordo. Well, your priest could do it in a very reverent way. It would still be a meeting of heaven and earth. The way that you construct your church and the way that you construct your songs and all these sorts of things. You don't have to sing Protestant songs to do Novus Ordo. You don't have to face um, it's not pro populum, but um, I, I forget the first word, but anyways, towards the people who you can do it ad orientum. And actually, if you look at the rubrics, it assumes ad orientum from um, people have said that. And then actually I was trying to you know read the rubrics myself. And it actually does. There's points where it's like, and then the priest turns to the people and blah, 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 blah. Well, if you're already facing the people, then you don't need to say face the people, right? So it's assuming that you're ad orientum facing the east. Um, and the idea that you... That, that you're going to fall away from the faith, that you're going to become a porn addicted divorcee on your third marriage... Because the Novus Ordo is at your parish, that's a personal failing. It's not God that's failing. Um, you could say that the church is failing in providing a, a edifying liturgy that, uh, a more edifying liturgy that um, subjectively allows you to, um, through your own subjective preferences, be able to allow you to focus your mind more. But if you Google um, St. John Cantius, ordinary form on or just look it up on youtube um it's in latin incensed all that kind of stuff and i understand the arguments of this prayer was removed and this prayer is important like i get that i'm not disagreeing necessarily with that but the idea that it can't be done reverently and that you can't have an edif uh, edifying experience um where christ is is becoming present before you that is a personal issue and you are allowing your your lack of charity your vanity your pride to say well i can't really worship christ truly present here unless i have what i want and once again i'm not saying that the ancient right should not be promoted but i'm saying is that that is a personal issue with you and that is something that you need to look deeply into yourself um, a reason for hope, though, is as we've seen, is that supposedly even though most bish enough bishops were saying that this, you know that these trad quote unquote trad communities were problems in their diocese, by and large the vast I saw, I saw a thing and, and I did not I was not able to and I I don't necessarily want to say this because I haven't been able to verify it but there was numbers that somebody had um, put up on Twitter. I was saying, like, so far it was like 16 dioceses had totally suppressed the Latin Mass. Um, about 30 had um, basically put some restrictions in. And it was like 170 basically said no changes whatsoever. So this kind of shows me that there is either wasn't that, you know, this widespread hatred by bishops. Uh, it was never present. Um, and that a lot of bishops, I think, actually do find them good to have and they're not causing problems and all these sorts of things that they're actually a good thing for these dioceses because they're probably one of the few parishes that are actually growing which is a good thing for a diocese um and it's also probably a response it was very heavy-handed as much as this pope has talked about mercy and as you know 
constantly said, who am I to judge? And wanted, you know, we need to show these people uh, mercy and, and give them a hand, even though they may be living an immoral life or have heretical teachings. We need to reach out and show them love and mercy and be imagers of God's mercy. This was a hammer down. Um, but there's no reason to lose hope. And there's no reason that the biggest thing I have a problem with is I see these people and I know it's young men who are, you know, whether their conversion was a year ago or whatever, were on Twitter F-bombing people who did not like or believe whatever it was that they liked or believed in at the time, whether it was political or whether it was about a TV show or a video game or whatever it may be, and then just transfer that attitude and go, well, I'm a trad now, so anybody that isn't trad, um, I'm, I'm just going to F-bomb them and call them every single name in the book. And this lack of charity is absolutely ridiculous, this idea of like i can look into everyone's soul and know well the reason you're saying this is because you're evil and you're a modernist and you're a heretic and you're an apostate and the reason that you prefer a, a charismatic service is obviously because you're a closet protestant and 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 the devil has a hold of you or something like that um it, there's like zero charity in some of these people absolutely zero charity and lack of charity is sorry to say it's a sin you can't sit there and blow up and F-bomb people and use every vulgarity in the book and then just say, well, I'm, I'm a trad, right? Sorry, I think I heard one of my kids above, maybe not. But you can't do that. Like going back to saying the traditional life, the traditional Catholic life and all these sorts of traditional um, ways of being are, part of that is like, and that's why I said it's, it's, it's cosplay. They want to put on... You know, it's it's like it's basically like uh, trad hipsters. You know, they want to put on the outfit and then say, you know, look at me. You know, I'm I'm from 1920s in Bur uh, Birmingham, uh, London, or whatever. It's not Birmingham, London, whatever. Birmingham in the UK. Um, but you know, the other go, well, I'm living a trad life, but I'm gonna drop every f bomb and and just be an absolutely just indistinguishable from some new atheists. Um. You know, people know us by how we act and, and they see Christ in us or they reject Christ because of us. And that you, the, the sin of scandal, the sin of committing a stumbling block is something you really don't want on your soul. It's not that it can't be forgiven, but a lot of people don't even think that it's a problem. And if you are not asking for forgiveness for a sin that you're committing, like there, there's a level of you're not held accountable for that ignorance, but like you're you're also held accountable for not kind of like talking to yourself and saying is this a good thing or not and as a trad you should be kind of aware of a lot of these things that modern people and modern christians overlook as far as for how we're supposed to act the sins that we do commit in our acts and our deeds if we are going on there and saying oh, well, we are the future of the church. We will save the church by restoring the ancient right. Also, I'm going to call you just absolutely vulgar, terrible names and just laugh about it when I, when some, when they respond to you saying, well, that's not very Catholic of you and just think that it's hilarious and say, you know, F you or something like that as a sign off. Like you are not, I mean, like they always want to bring up, well, Christ turned the tables. Yes, but one, you're not Christ and two, he was not throwing out curses and vulgars and F-bombs and all these sorts of things. And is anybody recognizing Christ in you in these actions? We have great hope. We know the ending to this story. The church does not fall. God wants us to be faithful. God wants us to be faithful to the church and to practice, you know, to be reverent and to practice the mass. Uh, or, I'm sorry practice a, a, a Catholic life, part of that being reverent liturgy, part of that being, you know, I, I think the ancient right. I'm not, I don't, I don't know God's will. Maybe it's not as right, but also we have to remember that all these sorts of things that you can point back to and say, well, it's, you know, the reason that we've lost faith is because of, you know, the new mass or Vatican II or whatever. It's like, it happened. If something happens, it's because it's either God's will that it happens he wants it to, right? Or 
he's letting it happen for another reason that we can't understand. Everything that is happening is either because God wants it to happen or he's allowing it to happen because we don't understand his will. And I don't understand it. Like, to me, wouldn't it be easier if Catholics did not, if we did not have this precipitous fall in vocations and people coming to church and um, attending the mass and um, believing the real presence? Like, I don't understand why this is happening. But that's where the part of faith in submission to God come in where we go, I don't get it, but your will be done. Help me to mold my will to you. Help me have the wisdom to understand what your will is so that I can follow you. Um, we're hitting over an hour, but I want to, to leave you with that is that we know the ending of the story. God's church will not fall. The prince of this world does not win. We don't know where we are in the story. But the last book of the Bible has given us, I mean, I mean, it's obviously very symbolic, but it's given us the screenplay for what happens. And we don't know, are we in the middle of this story, of the ending of the story? Are we towards the end or right at the beginning? What is the timeline? Does it not happen for another thousand years or 10,000 years? We don't know. What we do know is that we have the ability to follow God now in our lives. We have the ability to show charity to our fellow people. We have the ability to bow down in prayer. We have the ability to do all these things. We have the ability to stay steadfast. We have the ability through God's grace to save ourselves. Our soul getting to heaven is our number one priority in our lives. That is something that we, I, I don't want to say we have a level of control over because, you know, it, we need God, God's grace to be able to do so, but we can assist ourselves in many, many ways to doing that. And that's what we should be focused on. We should be focused on, on enriching our spiritual lives. We should be focusing on all these sorts of things. And we do not have the right to go and be uncharitable and be vulgar and, and make wild accusations for which that we are just going, well, in my opinion, based on I've seen this, this, and this, so I'm guessing this is what this person means and wants, right? That doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't bring them closer to God. At best, it brings them into a... At best, it gives them no new information and makes them feel uncharitable, brings them anger, brings them into states of sin. At worst, it gets people pushed out of church, out of the church. They start to leave and go, well, you know, this just seems so broken. I can't even imagine staying here anymore. Now, if you, there's a difference between saying, I think that, you know, like I recognize there's major problems and there's major problems in every single church. Don't let anybody fool you, whether they're Protestant or Orthodox or whatever. Modernity is creeping in everywhere. This is a great heresy that is affecting everybody. Some have been able to uh, weather that storm better in their liturgy. Some have been able to weather it better in how they um, are approaching morality or whatever, but everybody is being affected by this. And so there's a difference between recognizing the issues. And how many people that spent four hours, 15 hours on Twitter that day angrily responding to every person that was running a victory lap, every modernist Catholic or whoever running a victory lap saying, yeah, get rid of these guys, get rid of this stupid ancient stuff or whatever, and spent 10 hours reading, becoming angry, being uncharitable and vulgar and all these sorts of things. How many spent a tenth of that time in prayer, in reparation, in fasting, in time before the Blessed Sacrament? I'm not trying to hold myself up and saying, look at me, look at me. But like, I, I, I was trying to make myself conscious. I felt, I felt anger. I felt sad. And I ended up fasting a prolonged period uh, of that day. I had one, one meal towards the end of the day. Um, Friday's a usual fasting meal for me, but I usually have something at, uh, after three o'clock and then a meal at night. And I, you know, skipped it and just had kind of like a smaller meal at the end of the day and kind of this, I wanted to offer reparations up to God. And, and so that our, that our cries for, you know, please God assist us. Please accept this reparation for sins against your sacred heart would be heard. How many people were doing that? This isn't a, you know, people watching, well, I don't know, I, I, you know, we need to do this. Like, I'm not trying to attack you. I'm saying this is the way forward. 
if we spend 98% of our time in prayer and 2% of our time, you know, talking about it, this kind of stuff on Twitter, that's probably a much better way to go. And probably 100% of our time. Like, there are people, like, I'm, I'm not saying everybody, you know, everybody that wants to follow Christ needs to get off social media and do that. But there are times when you recognize, like, maybe I should take a break for a month, a day, a week, whatever, maybe. Not everybody's called to have a voice and make, you know, like, let everybody know what they're saying. And there's part of myself where I'm still struggling. Like, do I even do this? Is this even helpful? Is this useful? Um, am I better serving God and myself and my family by maybe um, focusing more on, on prayer? And on, excuse me, catechesis on my children and things like that. Um, or can I do both, right? And so it's something, and if I come to the idea that uh, I, I, my voice doesn't need to be out there. That's when I'll kind of sign off again. Um, that's part of the reason for my, my quietness is like, do, am, am I being helpful or am I contributing to scandal by talking about this? Um, it's something that I'm trying to discern. So anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll sign off here and I appreciate, uh, you guys listening. I appreciate you listening. Um, please head over, follow me on Twitter. Uh, you can find me at Paracelsus Burns, P-A-R-A-C-E-L-S-U-S-B-U-R-N-S, Paracelsus Burns, or head over to locals, ozymandias.locals.com, O-Z-Y-M-A-N-D-I-A-S.locals.com. I know I need to make things uniform and easier to understand, but all the good handles are taken. Um, I really, I really do appreciate it. Please pray, increase your prayer increase your fasting, pray for the church, pray for our bishops, pray for our Pope, make reparations to God. We are in an age where we need to make a lot of reparations to God for these sacrileges, irreverences, uh, mockeries, destructions of the churches of God, desecrations of Christ's real presence in the Eucharist. We need to be, um, very penitential and, and, and a lot of reparations in these days, but uh, please take that into consideration. But anyways, I, I appreciate you guys listening. Te Deum Laudimus. Thanks be to God.